Now, Jephthah. What about this fellow Jephthah? He's famous for basically one thing. He's a Gileadite. Uh, it didn't really fit into society real well. Um, and so basically he was driven out because he was not accepted. His mother, uh, some illegitimacy there or whatever. And uh, what happens? Um, does God ever say the exact opposite of what he means? In chapter 10, verse 14, God says this. But you have forsaken me. He's talking to the people of Israel. He says, you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. God's role as the rescuer. I will no longer save you. And then God says this, go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Go cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. Is God commanding his people to, to idolatry here? He says, go to the gods you've made and, and cry out to them. Is God commanding idolatry here? Is this sarcasm? Is God being sarcastic? He says, hey, I'm no longer going to save you because you guys are worshiping these idols. Okay, go to the idols. Let them save you. That's sarcastic. He's wanting them to tell them to get rid of the idols and come back to him. But he uses sarcasm here, saying the exact opposite of what he meant. And again, is there sarcasm in the Bible? Actually, does God get sarcastic? Yes, he does. Okay, so you've got to be real careful. I'm not using that as an excuse. A lot of times I use sarcasm. Can sarcasm be very detrimental? And I, I'll never forget my daughter. I used sarcasm when she was in sixth grade. And she came back to me like 10, 15 years later. And she said, I remember when you said, and quoted some crazy thing that I had said, but I was being sarcastic. She didn't get the fact that it was sarcastic. And she thought that's what I actually held. So what I'm saying is be careful with sarcasm. Can sarcasm do damage on people who don't understand? But God uses it here. So there's a place for sarcasm. There's a place not for sarcasm. Sounds like Ecclesiastes or something. <laughs> Anyways, okay, time to be sarcastic in that. So context, context determines meaning. And it's clear here God didn't mean for them to be idolaters. He's, by the way, this is the point. God is using sarcasm to do what? What is the function of the sarcasm? Does the sarcasm function to rebuke them? So he's using sarcasm to rebuke them, okay? And so you've got to pick that up from the context then and things. Now, what happens? Jephthah goes out and says, okay, I'll fight for you guys. Uh, I, will be, I will lead you. I'll be the judge and things like that. God makes him a judge and things. And then he says this, um, the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. This is chapter 11, verse 29. He crossed over Gilead and things. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. And this is the vow. This is what Jephthah is most famous for, his vow. He says to God, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. He goes out to battle against the Ammonites. The Ammonites are over here in Jordan. And what happens? He comes home. Who comes out to meet him when he comes home? His daughter. Okay, his daughter comes out to meet him when he comes home. And so now this raises a question about vows. Um, do you have to be careful about taking vows before God? Ecclesiastes has some interesting things on this. Let me just read this. Um, it was um, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Um, Ecclesiastes, there's great wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes, by the way. Um, and it says this. When you make a vow to God, or actually, let me start back up of verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to sacrifice, offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Then down to verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not to fulfill it. 
It is better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. And what does he say? When you go into the house of the God, let your words be few. I worry sometimes about some of these youth rallies they have when I was younger. They, and then people get up there and say, oh, you know, do you commit yourself to reading you know, three chapters of scripture every day? How many of you will do that? Let everybody stand up. And so all the people stand up and they make a vow to read, things like that. And what I'm saying is be very careful about doing that, okay? God does not delight in fools. And just be careful about making vows before God. Be careful about it. Jephthah makes this vow. Whatever comes out the door of my house. Now the question comes up then, does Jephthah burn his daughter up? Does Jephthah burn his daughter up? Does he burn her as a sacrifice? Uh, let me just say this. Um, probably 80 to 90 percent of Old Testament scholars say Jephthah burned his daughter up. Probably 80 to 90 percent of scholars say Jephthah burned his, burned his daughter up. Okay, 80 to 90 percent of Old Testament scholars. Now what should that do? I'm going to tell you that I don't think he burned her, but what should that put in the back of your mind? Hillebrand's the professor of this class. He's got it right. <laughs> no, no. Okay, Hillebrand is most possibly wrong on this, but does he still think it's right? Okay, what I'm saying is I, I know that most of my friends who are Old Testament scholars would disagree with me on this point, but let me tell you why I think that Jephthah did not burn his daughter up, okay? I, I think he didn't, okay? But uh, it's a minority position. So what I'm trying to say is... Uh, do I have to admit that I can be wrong sometimes? Yeah, and I, I may be, well be wrong here. And I just want to warn you that this is a minority position, so he may have burned her up. But here's the reasons why I think he didn't, okay? So let me, um, um, first of all, uh, when she is told, when Jephthah returned to his house in Mitzpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of tambourines. Her father's come home from the war. It's like a military guy coming back from Afghanistan. His kids run out and just see daddy's home. And she... And then it says, she was his only child. Why does it bring that up, that she was his only child? Just notice that. She was his only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. So it makes it really, really explicit. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemy. So she says, okay, I'm in with this too, father. She says, give me two months. She has one request from her dad. She says, give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends. Why? Because I'm going to be burned up? No. She says, let me go two months to roam the hills to weep with my friends because I will never marry. Now, if you were getting burned up and on a sacrifice on an altar, would you be worried the fact that you never married? Or would marriage kind of take a little, I mean, if you're going to be burned with fire, is that a little bit more important than being married? Okay, so, but notice here she says, go that I may never marry. You may go. And she went two months in the hills. She and the girls went out in the hills and wept because she would never marry. And after two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he had vowed. And then what's the next line? And she was a virgin. And you say, wait a minute, he just burned her up. Who gives a rip at that point whether well, she's a virgin or not? This guy just smoked his daughter up with a sacrificial fire. Okay, why would it mention, and she was a virgin? Do virgins burn hotter or what's the deal? I mean, you know what I'm saying. I mean, just, I'm sorry, but just, you know, why, why in other words, if he just burned her up, why would you mention right after he burned her up that she's a virgin? If something else happened, however, is it possible that what he says, that he would offer up whatever came out the door of his house, two things, two ways of taking this. Is it possible to read it like this? The Hebrew word for and can also be translated or. The Hebrew word for and can also be translated or. Does, is there a difference between and and or? What if you take it this way? If you give me the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, or I will offer it as a sacrifice. Now, the NIV says, will be the Lord's, and I will offer it as a sacrifice. Is that different than saying, I will dedicate it to the Lord, or I will offer it as a sacrifice? And that allows him then to dedicate his daughter to the Lord, by the way, is it important then that she's a virgin, that she never married, that she's dedicated to the Lord? What does that mean? Will she have any children? She will never have any children. That means that Jephthah will have what? Descendants. She is his only daughter. 
Is it show, by the way, in the ancient world, was it a big thing to have no descendant? Did your line end at that point? And that's why then she's weeping, he's weeping, because his line is over. She is his last shot at having descendants, and now it's cut off. She's dedicated to the Lord. She will never marry. She's a virgin. She will have no children. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay, so I think that's what happened. She, he dedicated to the Lord. By the way, if you go over to Numbers chapter 8, and Dr. Gordon Hugenberger at Park Street Church uh, pointed this out. I think it was a brilliant uh, observation. I missed it, actually. Uh, in the past. That's why I love going to his church. I, every time I go to his church, I learn something new. And uh, he pulled this thing out of Numbers chapter 8, verse 11. Check this out. Uh, Numbers 8, verse 11, it says, Aaron is to present the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering. The Levites are to be presented as a wave offering. Does that mean that he kills all the Levites and waves them before the Lord as a sacrifice? No, it means he dedicates them to the Lord as a sacrifice. Does anybody remember Romans chapter 12, verse 1? As a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That we are to dedicate ourselves as a sacrifice to God as well. So that it's more of a dedicatory thing when it refers to human beings. So I think between these things then, so I want to suggest then, but by the way, do I have to kind of back off myself to say what? Most Old Testament scholars disagree with me. Is it likely that I'm wrong here? The honest truth is I may be. The NIV is translated with an and instead of an or. So you, you know what I'm saying? At certain points, you've got to be humble. You, you, can you still be stubborn, though? And say, I think, I, think, I think he didn't burn it. I think he dedicated it to the Lord. And I think the context kind of indicates that. But it very well could be wrong here. So, okay. That's just, that's Jephthah. Now, Shibboleth and Sibboleth. This is an SAT question, a vocabulary question on the SAT. Shibboleth. What does Shibboleth mean? Shibboleth is like an in word that gets you into a group, right? Are there certain groups that have certain words that they use that get you into their group? Like if I said, I'm part of the 99, that would get me into, I'm part of the 99%. That would get me into what group? Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, I'm part of the 99%. Okay, I'm, <laughs> on these salaries, you can be guaranteed we're not part of the 1%. Uh, but I'm not part of the 99. But that's a big you know, thing for them, uh, the 99, okay, percent. So, so each, various groups have certain buzzwords that they use, each group. And, and have you seen this in high school? Do they still do it in high school? So different groups have different buzzwords that they use. Um, athletic guys talk a certain way. Um, people that are doing drugs in my day talked a different way. Um, and so different people talk with different jive talk and stuff. And so what happens is, here's what happens with Jephthah. Jephthah's fighting over here in Jordan, and the Ephraimites who are over here, they didn't come over to help Jephthah. And so they come over to Jephthah, and they want to make war with Jephthah, saying, you didn't invite us to war and things like that. We're going to come over and now raise Cain with you. So Jephthah gets, sets up at the Jordan River, and as the Ephraimites cross the Jordan River, he gets them to say, Shibboleth. But he knows that because they're from Ephraim, they can't say Shibboleth because they always say Ka and they say Idir. And so he knows that he can, because they say Idir and Ka, that he knows they're from Boston. And he knows there's regional dialects. If I said, y'all come down to my place, or, you know, you would say y'all. As soon as I say y'all, what happens? In New England, when you say y'all, your IQ goes down 20 points. Okay, now that's how it is in, no, seriously, that's how it is in New England. On the other hand, if you talk with a British accent in New England, what happens? Your IQ goes up 20 points, okay? So I'm just joking, but not really. So anyways, okay. So what, what, what I'm saying is, when they cross here, he says, say Shibboleth, and they say Sibboleth. And he says, those guys are Ephraimites, and then he knew that they were trying to, you know, they were lying. He knew by the way they pronounced it that they were lying, and then he k killed the Ephraimites, okay? So this shibboleth, shibboleth is used then, and in general, it's an English word now, it's a Hebrew word, but it's come over into English to mean a buzzword within a certain group that means you're identified with that group, okay? So, and every group has these buzzwords. By the way, do we as Christians talk in a certain language that's different? You know what I'm saying? We have our certain buzzwords as well. Every, every group will have their buzzwords kind of thing. So shibboleth, those buzzwords, those, those group identifying words are called shibboleths. Shibboleths. So 